the brain, a pulpy mass of cells and fibers, is the center of the network of fibers that make up man's nervous system. When I was a kid, I was really not into superheroes. Hello? I'll be on my way. <laughs> I really like the villains. There was one especially that I thought was really intriguing called The Riddler. Played by Jim Carrey in Batman Forever. He had this device that allowed him to connect his brain to a computer and read the minds of people and absorb knowledge. I'm sucking up your IQ. Vacuuming the cortex. Feeding off your brain. Crazy, I thought. But maybe not impossible. What if you could control devices around you directly through your mind? Or imagine being able to download information directly into your brain by being connected to the internet. Would you choose to stay yourself or would you embrace your new digitized self? There is a growing market for a technology that will connect your brain directly to AI. It's called Brain Computer Interface or in short, BCI. BCIs are nothing new, they've been used in medical settings for years. But now some companies want to make them available for consumers to be used in gaming, UX, and even the military. BCIs represent an exciting opportunity for unlocking and expanding the power of our most powerful and mysterious organ. But right because of that, what risks do they bring? And how can we prevent them from happening? This is the story of how our minds merge with machines. AI and machine learning can be dominated by us. We can solve that with a chip. And, and this is something that I think most people don't quite understand yet. There's a small town in Germany, not too far away from where I grew up, called Jena. Just outside of the town, in 1892, a young military apprentice called Hans Berger fell off his horse during just a routine exercise. He fell hard, badly injuring himself, but luckily he survived. Miles away and not knowing about the incident, Berger's sister had a really uncomfortable feeling. So she sent her brother a telegraph to just ask how he was doing. A crazy coincidence, but Hans Berger saw this as being much more than just that. He described it as a case of spontaneous telepathy in which at a time of mortal danger, I transmitted my thoughts to my sister. And he became so obsessed with this idea that he might have communicated with his sister through his mind that he was like, you know what? I'm gonna go to study medicine to understand what happened. And that's what he did. And after graduating, he started a bunch of research projects in understanding how the brain works, which initially failed pretty badly. Hmm. But Berger kept going. And in 1924, after trying out different devices and learning from failed experiences, he starts noticing something. His galvanometer started showing oscillations, which turned out were the first recordings of human brainwaves. He published his findings in his piece on the human electroencephalogram, or short EEG. By the mid-1930s, EEGs became the basics for brain analysis. A couple decades later, just across the Atlantic at UCLA's Brain Research Institute, a researcher called Jacques Videl built on Berger's idea, and he predicted that human beings were just about to develop devices that could basically function as communication pathways between brains and computers. He coined them brain-computer interfaces, or in short, BCIs. And put simply, BCIs would work in two directions. On the one hand, they would translate EEG signals into actions to computers, so from the brain to machines. What we've done here, if you think about it, is to take the biological output of neurons, the zeros and ones that they generate, and feed that directly into a, a machine learning network, a deep net and decoding your intention. And on the other hand, they would be able to send signals back into the brain from a computer to, for example, treat some brain-related illnesses. Take a look at this amazing footage where a patient suffering from Parkinson turned on his BCI.
Today, BCIs are used mostly in medical settings, but also in other areas such as gaming. So how did BCIs make this jump from a medical device to a more consumer-based tool looking more like from a sci-fi movie? Hello, everybody. I think even in a benign AI scenario, we will be left behind. With um, a high bandwidth brain machine interface, I think we can actually go along for the ride. After, after solving a bunch of brain related diseases, there is the, the existential, uh, it's mitigation of the existential threat of AI. Whoa, oh, okay. Surviving AI. Yes, so Elon Musk believes that over the next couple decades, artificial intelligence will surpass human intelligence which would make us evolutionarily redundant or even post an existential threat to humanity. But what do BCIs have to do with this? Here's a picture of your brain. Right now, your brain has a cortex, which makes mostly rational decisions, and a limbic system, which regulates emotions and behavior. Now, Elon Musk thinks that BCIs will add a third digital AI layer, which could absorb information and skills, and on the other hand, give commands to machines. And in fact, you, you already have this layer. So it's your phone and your laptop. And the constraint is just the, how well you interface the, the, the input and output speed. That is how Elon Musk thinks brain-computer interfaces will keep us relevant in an age of AI. Not by fighting it, not by preventing it, but by merging with it. Sounds crazy. Probably is. But the truth is that BCIs are in full development. The market for BCIs is forecasted to grow to about $4 billion in the next five years. For comparison, that is about the same that the whole of the UK spent on streaming last year. So it's clear that a lot of money is being invested to get into your brain. But why? Think about in how many areas of your life you interact with technology. Probably a lot. For each of these areas, brain-computer interfaces could remove the barrier between your brain and the technology. So there's an almost infinite amount of applications where they can be useful. But there's one thing in particular that could make brain-computer interfaces one of the most valuable technologies ever. Brain-computer interfaces will become extremely valuable, not only because of the utility they provide to users, but rather because of the data they produce. I call it data about thoughts. Data about thoughts is the most intimate and personal form of data. It's literally about everything that happens inside your brain. As brain-computer interfaces will be maturing, they will increasingly be able to translate this neural activity into data, including thought patterns, ideas, even images. It will document not only actions that have taken place, but also just mere considerations of things that are yet to happen, or perhaps never will. This data could be used for better understanding the human brain, improved learning, psychological treatments, or companies holding this data. This is of course an absolute goldmine, providing insanely accurate customer insights. This is where the real value of BCI comes from. It's the data. Now, I actually cannot read your mind, <laughs> But I'm pretty sure that by now, some of you might be thinking, this doesn't feel 100% right, am I right? And yeah, I think you have a point. There are many, many questions that are unanswered. Take, for example, the issue of privacy. Already today, firms are collecting personal data in order to influence purchasing behavior or even voting during elections. Cambridge Analytica, the embattled political research firm, was accused of improperly accessing sensitive user information. Data about thoughts would basically put these risks on steroids. But BCIs could also aggravate these issues through incidents of brain jack where basically an external actor takes care of your neural interface and makes you do things that you didn't agree with. There's a variety of other issues, such as how brain-computer interfaces could impact economic and social class divisions, or legal and philosophical questions of what it still means to be human. Data about thoughts is an essential bastion of privacy. Protecting it and making sure that our thoughts maintain autonomy will be key for maintaining liberty and freedom of thought. After all, don't we all have secrets? The final question is, of course, 
What can we do to ensure that people will benefit from brain-computer interfaces whilst mitigating its risks? The key with brain-computer interfaces will be to set the right governance framework for managing data about thoughts and ensuring that only a select number of actors will be able to get to this data for only a very strictly defined purpose. Compare this about how you feel about your medical record only a hundred times more personal and intimate. These discussions need to start now, as the question is not if BCIs will be able to read data about thoughts, but when. Hey friends, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you found this content useful, please make sure to hit the subscribe button and I hope to see you back soon.